Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Elixir Mix. This week on our panel, we have Mark Erickson. Hey there. Josh Adams. Howdy. Eric Berry. Hey, ho. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest, and that's Hubert Wapitsky. And I know I totally killed it, but he, he can correct me. Go ahead, Hubert. Do you want to introduce yourself? That was almost perfect. So, so you, you nailed it. Uh, so yeah, uh, nice, nice to be here. Thanks for ho- hosting me, guys. No problem. Do you want to just talk a little bit about what you do at Amberbit before we dive in? Because uh, I've been a consultant in the past. And yeah, I, I want to give you a chance to just talk about what you do. So uh, we've been traditionally doing uh, Ruby on Rails apps for our customers for good eight years or something like that uh, until we decided to try Elixir. And that's where we are here. So we are largely doing more or less the same things, which is basically building custom apps for our customers. Uh, we just switched the backend stack uh, from Ruby to Elixir. And uh, yeah, we can talk about it. I guess that's why I'm here. But yeah, custom apps. Very cool. So um, just to kind of get us started, and this is sort of the topic of the blog post that, uh, that at least I ran across and we invited you on to talk about, is why just switch? Why switch from Ruby to Elixir? Right. So the story behind it was okay. So maybe maybe I'll start with uh, where I first stumbled upon Elixir. I didn't really treat it seriously. Like it, it looked for a long time for me like a hobby project, and probably it was at the beginning a hobby project. But um, we had some real problems with uh, uh, scaling Ruby and uh, just making. It was just making some use cases harder than they really should have been, and we knew that. So we were sort of like looking for alternatives, and obviously we looked at different stacks, different technologies. We got interested in Clojure. We got interested in other functional stacks. And uh, yeah, uh, somebody said, okay, why not Elixir? And uh, And we tried it first. We tried it slow with some... Optimize basically as a means to optimize uh, performance of some Ruby apps and just replaced it uh, endpoint but a point uh, on the API side of things with Elixir. We've been quite happy with it. We've been actually, actually uh, very surprised how it performed in production. And uh, then we migrated more and more stuff to Elixir. And now we're uh, almost uh, Ruby free, uh, I would say. Is that a good thing? <laughs> a, yeah, I think that's a loaded question, isn't it? A little bit. A, um, almost Ruby free is like, man, we we've almost <laughs> we we've almost got rid of the our um, you know our bad bacteria or something. It's just an interesting thing to say. So, what are your thoughts on Ruby now? Uh, I love Ruby, so I really love Ruby. I, I, I I've been working with Ruby for many many years, but the thing about Ruby is that it has the same problems it had when I was starting with Ruby. So despite the, the hardware, the environment, the applications also changed a lot, the way we build applications. The same basic issues we stumbled upon with Ruby, which was, uh, well, inability to do concurrency properly, inability, inability to handle memory in a, in a way that it... Uh, doesn't waste and return memory and doesn't leak memory or occasional crashes. That those things were plague of the Ruby deployments when we started building Rails applications. And uh, despite a lot of changes in the environment, and I think Ruby also improved, but the core issues I think they stayed there with the 
MRI, which is the main Ruby implementation. And it's like a bit of a sad thing because I know that many people were working on those things, trying to improve them. A lot of effort has been put on, but it might be just that the functional languages or especially Erlang Virtual Machine has been especially built to address those issues as a core and Ruby hasn't. And it's, it's not a Ruby's fault, but in, in certain types of projects, is it really is a problem that you have to work around somehow. And uh, how? Uh, well, in some cases, you just throw a pile of money on uh, your DevOps team, on your hardware, making sure that uh, you know whenever things crash or they go out, out of hand, uh, they, they, they get handled properly, or when you have performance issues, you just scale it with more machines and stuff like that. So you can, you can definitely do stuff with Ruby, but with Elixir and Erlang, that's just so much easier to do those things. So that's why I'm looking into uh, Elixir and Erlang with a bit more positive view now, I would say. How is the uh, learning curve for you uh, as you started getting into this? Is it just you on Amberbit or is, uh, do you have a team? No, we have a team of over a dozen developers. Uh, and the learning, that's an actually interesting question because the lear, learning curve is harder than you would expect. That's my, my, my thinking. Like some people think that Elixir and Ruby are, are very similar. I think they're not. And uh, it looks like a bit of a false friend. It looks... Uh, uh, similar on the surface to, to, to Ruby, while it's not. It, it's very different programming language and, and, and basic concepts. So I found it, like I assumed it's going to be quicker transition from, from from Ruby to Elixir, but it actually involves significant mindset. I think it is easier to jump, jump around object-oriented programming languages, like between Java and uh, Ruby, or even PHP and Ruby or Python and Ruby, uh, then to jump between Ruby and Elixir because just it's a different model, totally. So Mark, I saw you kind of chuckling uh, to the comment that it's nothing like Ruby. <laughs> Any comments on that? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, but that's one of the things I think is fun about Elixir is the syntax is heavily borrowed from Ruby or inspired by, which I think is really good because there's a lot to like about that syntax. But it gives you that, it's kind of, you know, what Hubert was saying, is it gives you that uh, false sense of, oh, this is just like Ruby. I can just get running right away. And it is, it's a bigger mental shift. If nothing else, then you're going into uh, more pure functional and it's not object oriented. And just making some of those mental shifts uh, are bigger than you think. But uh, I think they're, in, in many ways, it's just, you're taking away all of these layers that you've been learning as an object oriented programmer. And you're getting simpler and simpler. And it can be kind of hard when you, you've built up years of experience as this object-oriented programmer. Like, this is how I solve problems. I build these additional abstractions. And I build abstractions on top of abstractions and more classes and interfaces. And, and, uh, and then you're like realizing, oh, I can just keep stripping these away. And I don't need them in a functional uh, language where uh, data is immutable. And, and it's just, so yeah, I laugh at it because it's like, it's true. It's a more of a mental shift. It's not a technically hard thing. It's, it's more of a mental shift that you're going through. But I, I agree, yes. It's difficult also to get rid of those things you, you learned while you were doing Ruby or other object-oriented programming languages. Like I've seen people who tried to implement crazy stuff like inheritance uh, uh, on their modules and, and things like that in Elixir. While you don't really need to do those sort of things in, in functional programming language or, you know, some people try to apply the uh, classic design patterns as well, but they, they don't really map well in, in large uh, uh, majority, I think, to, 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 to functional work. Yeah, I kind of see that in the um, sort of HTTP poison and, and HTTP potion. Like, they feel very much like this is how you would do this in Ruby, but uh, they take away a lot of flexibility. Uh, that's, that's an example. I'm also curious... Uh, do you find that people find your Ruby looks funky now? <laughs> I, uh, I recently, uh, that's actually interesting uh, because uh, I've been assigned to have a look at the Ruby library and I started fiddling around and changing it and uh, doing some tweaks and I, I realized 
oh my god, I cannot write Ruby anymore. Like, I, I'm writing something. And actually, th- th- this boils down to, to those two languages being similar. I was writing function and doing do end, and it, it, it didn't want to run and didn't give me like meaningful uh, error message. And uh, I was like, why this doesn't compile? It certainly compiles in my head. But oh, no, in, in, in Ruby, you don't have to have this extra do before, uh, before the function block. And I was like, no, I cannot write Ruby anymore. So, so I, I un- unlearned it a bit. Uh, I don't write much Ruby. I think uh, I, I was touching recently some legacy systems. Uh, it's fine. It's, it's not a big deal. But those sort of quirks that those languages are similar, but they're different, they, they, they usually catch me. Uh, at first. So one other direction. So I, I talked to a lot of people under a lot of circumstances. One direction that I see people moving off of Ruby toward is Elixir. But one other direction I see them moving in is Node. So, you know, what, what does Elixir offer that Node doesn't? It's not crazy, I would say. Like... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, can, can you clarify? <laughs> nah, uh, yeah, well... We have integers. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it's a big thing. You might want integers. No, uh, so 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 okay. So while yeah, language is always one thing, right? So language that has integers, that's definitely something you want to have. And, and you know, JavaScript has been designed for different tasks, and it's being used today. So it, it shows in in how you how you how you write programs. Very much defensive programming has to be applied in 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 JavaScript, so that you are sure your date types are what you expect them to be and stuff like that because it's a weekly type type language. Uh, I think that's one of the problems of JavaScript in general and you know, that also translates to the backend application, which is, uh, like not, let's say, Node.js. But that's not the only issue. The, 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 the biggest issue, actually, I think, is the runtime design and uh, how Node uh, relies on the asynchronous callbacks while in Erlang and Elixir, the concurrent programming model is based on you know programs that look sequential and they, they, they just communicate for passing messages. So that's a bit of a small talky way of thinking about things, if you think about it. Uh, so if you think about programming in, in asynchronous manner to achieve concurrency, that mental model to map those things, I think, is harder and way harder to write readable programs than in sequential programming, where you just write programs that execute step after step after step, and then there maybe like exchange some messages, but there's nothing really much that async about it. So uh, async programming is just hell on earth. To be fair. So we, we've kind of talked about some of the uh, contrast between different languages. Um, you also mentioned like over .NET or Java, but um, I, I think people are, at least the, the audiences that I talk to, especially in web, you know, most people are working in, you know, the more Ruby and Node. So, um, I, and, and I don't know that it's helpful to compare, you know, all the different languages necessarily. What, what is it that Elixir is particularly good at that you, that you like? I mean, you mentioned in this blog post that um, it's terrific for web applications. So why build web applications in Elixir? What does it offer that, lacks in other languages? I don't think it, it, it actually offers anything that lacks. Like There, there are other languages that uh, offer similar experience, um, but it's just, it's like a different parameters are presented in different amounts, uh, in different environments, in different languages. And, and, and Elixir provides a nice balance between uh, between the level of abstractions it provides and flexibility and also between well maybe not performance but like raw performance but predict uh, performance being being predictable so we can predict the performance and assume it's going to be consistent uh, while in other sometimes programming languages uh, you just have no idea how the apps gonna perform especially under heavy load they're gonna perform very differently while in elixir they tend to perform more consistently, I would say. Um, why would you want to build apps uh, in, in, in Elixir? Is, is the, usually the answer is because you, your team wants to. 
So if you have a team who wants to, because when you start a project, you, you largely look at what kind of developers you have available. And if you, all you have are Node.js developers on hand and you cannot really find other developers, even if it's not the best choice for the platform, you don't really have much choice. You just have to go with Node.js. And the same goes with, uh, with Ruby. Uh, there's a big market for Ruby developers. So I think it's a valid reason to just go with Ruby because you have so many Ruby developers uh, on the market that you can hire easily. Uh, the same with PHP. Uh, and, and with Elixir, it might be the other way around, that you have team, you're not hiring, and they really want to uh, write Elixir, and, and you just let them. That's perfectly valid use case. And it might bring you unexpected good side effects that your software suddenly became better, became uh, more predictable, became simpler. And yeah, that's, I think that's a good reason to try. I, I've, I've always disliked the argument that you should you know, build a thing in, in what you know because you know it uh, with, with the exception of projects that you know, don't expect to be heavily developed after more than like six weeks. Because on like a four-month project, the learning curve of getting up to speed with any, any new language seems pretty low compared to the lifetime maintenance of the project. So um, I've heard that argument a whole lot. I've always hated it. Maybe not always. I've hated it for a long time. Um, not suggesting that I hate that you made the argument. I just know that people make the argument and it seems like seems like focusing on optimizing for the wrong thing to me. I think that's fair. But at the same time, what, what I heard when he said, you know, picking a, a technology because your team wants to work in it was mostly to get your team on board and get them engaged with the project. And to me, that makes a ton of sense because if they engage and they get excited about the project, you're going to get better work. Yeah, I, I do agree with that bit. So uh, there's a reason why you should listen to your team. Like um, they might see things that you don't see because they work with the code on a daily basis. And they sometimes it might just because something seems trendy, like, oh, uh, I don't know, another uh, JavaScript front-end framework. But sometimes it might be because because it's genuinely bringing uh, some improvement to their workflow and, and making their lives easier. And I think that's largely the case with Elixir. And uh, yeah, I would encourage you to try it. Uh, and just don't jump on it like you have no Elixir experience, no Elixir developers, and you're going to start building another big project using now Elixir and not Ruby. I think you should start slow with uh, some smaller API backend side of these types of things until your developers really learn uh, the language environment. It takes actually, I think, months to learn properly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably fair. We introduced it the first time in my consultancy for something that was explicitly highly concurrent. It was just a, sort of a WebSocket location subscription updating thing, the sort of thing that seems it's fairly trivial to build, but uh, really hard to get the performance we wanted at scale out of Ruby without throwing too much hardware at it. But precisely. That's precisely where Elixir uh, and Phoenix shines. Uh, another use case that uh, I would bring uh, uh, is GraphQL. So that actually, actually is related to one another. But uh, if you want to build GraphQL APIs, Elixir is a really good platform because it's got a very good e ecosystem with uh, uh, good libraries to use. And uh, it makes building those sort of APIs uh, very easy, including subscriptions, which uh, which are its mechanism to do real-time updates. Yeah, yeah, and I we we've, we've talked a little bit about Absinthe on the show, um, as far as GraphQL goes. One thing that I was curious about, and this is something that you mentioned in your blog post, was the ability to break things down into libraries and use umbrella projects. I'm not familiar with the term umbrella project. And I don't know if that's uh, Elixir lingo or something else that I just don't know. Um, but I'm also curious, you know, how do you break up a project that's different from how you would do something in something like uh, Rails or Express or something like that? All right. So, yeah, I actually like that aspect of Elixir very much, being able to break things up into smaller chunks and make those chunks fairly independent of each other. Whether it's a module, whether it's, uh, it's a context, or whether we're talking about the apps uh, or umbrella projects, that these are just different mechanisms built in either runtime or language that allow you to just achieve those separation, greater separation of pieces of code. 
uh, and we like that as a programmers because then we can work on those things independently or we can replace them one without touching another. So uh, you asked what the umbrella project is. Uh, maybe before I answer that, I, I, I let's just focus quickly on on how Beam, which is Erlang's virtual machine, runs applications differently than, say, Ruby's virtual machine. In, in Ruby, you generally spawn uh, one main application, which is like a, your Rails application. And then this application requires some libraries, and it will use those libraries as dependencies. And they will, would still run within the same within the same workspace, I would say, of, of the virtual machine. So that's like everything's bundled together. Everything runs in the same uh, process, shares, shares memory, and, and, and uh, is basically the same runtime process. This is going to change with, in, in, in Ruby with uh, Ruby 3.0 uh, at some point in the future, where there's going to be more robust model where you can actually have multiple concurrent applications running within one virtual machine. But that is directly influenced by uh, Erlang's model, where you spawn multiple applications running within single virtual machine. Those applications uh, run, can be started and stopped in, independently of each, of each other, and they can also have dependencies between them. So one application can rely on the other application to be started before it's being started. So when you think about it, it's it's like a it's designed for concurrency also in, in the way it, it starts and manages applications. Moreover, you can have those applications uh, running on different uh, hosts, for example, and then you have cluster of airline nodes that communicate over network. So those are interesting things. But the umbrella project is something that allows you to, in a, in a more simpler way start those multiple applications on a single uh, project, especially in development. So you can just, you, you can not care about the whole concurrency or the clustering or aspect of, of things, but you just want to have different chunks of code responsible for different things. Like, I don't know, user registration, there's a web front end, and there's a database backend, and there's something that uh, uploads files uh, to as free buckets. And, and this is logical to separate those things into separate applications. Okay, so in Elixir, you can do just that. You create an umbrella project, uh, put in those four applications inside. You can work on them independently on each other and then start it uh, either in development or in production. Altogether, it brings it up all nicely together and, and things just work. So, so uh, it's a little convenience concept introduced that's actually built on top of underlying airlines uh, concepts. Deploy more, pay less with DigitalOcean, the simplest all-in-one cloud computing platform for developers. Scale and run cloud applications faster and more efficiently with effortless administration tools to robust compute, flexible configurations, networking services, real-time alerts, and rapid provisioning while enjoying industry-leading price to performance with a flat pricing structure across all global data center regions at any usage volume. Spend more time building better web apps and less time worrying about managing infrastructure with DigitalOcean. Build your next app on DigitalOcean. Get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash elixir. Yes, I am a big fan of Umbrella Projects. And just to kind of reiterate and kind of back up what he was saying, um, some of the things that I see where people make mistakes with umbrellas is where they are creating the wrong lines between their separation of their applications. And then they have pain because they're trying to, they're trying, they have circular references and it, it's just, they've, they've drawn the wrong lines. And I think like uh, at the company where I am currently, we have a situation where we have like three or four different applications. And there, one is Rails, and then there are three other like Phoenix applications, and they're separate Phoenix applications. And some of these are very small, and they kind of fit the idea of a microservice. And I love it when we can bring those into an umbrella and have the microservice as like a, a, a one of those small applications in the umbrella, because then you have this benefit of I, I can talk to this other application and not have to go through a whole network stack to talk to it and you know make a web request. And it's easier to bring up and shut down the whole thing together on my uh, development machine 
and it works just great in production, bringing the whole thing up and down. So yeah, um, I love umbrellas. I think they're great. And I do think some people, we just need to, in the community, maybe uh, have some better examples about where the right lines are for breaking them up so that people can have a better experience with them. But yeah, I love umbrellas. You're right on. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, although uh, you don't have to use umbrella projects. Uh, it's just a convenience. Uh, we're developing projects where we don't use umbrella and we just have uh, separate directories in, 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 in the single project. And we, you can specify dependencies between those. There has been an issue with uh, Phoenix Reloader, if you go that route. Like only one application would reload the code. Uh, I think I actually made a pull request last month or a couple months ago to Phoenix that fixes that. So you can now specify which applications will be reloadable. So, so, so you can uh, not just reload the code base of your UI application, the Phoenix application, but also it would reload the, some of your dependencies if you want. I like to think about it like there's, a, there's usually one or, or multiple front-end applications and the rest is dependencies of those. I like to think about it in a, like a tree way. Then you don't get to have those circular dependencies between things if you, if you mentally think about it in a tree-like structure where your front-end is here and then there are just dependencies below. Also, I wanted to speak to what you were saying about the Elixir having good performance. And uh, we've seen the same thing over Ruby. Um, it's like uh, coming back to a work situation, I've got a uh, large Rails application and we've been slowly breaking it out and pulling and moving pieces over to a Phoenix application. And one of the things that was surprising is, uh, so the team had tackled this before I joined with this project, and that was that they were able to kind of move the ownership of a database table, like a, a model, move the ownership of it from one Rails application to an Elixir application. And then when they make requests for it, they're uh, going through an API. And the most surprising thing was, is it was still faster to go to Elixir to do it that way than it was to load it from Rails and Ruby. And the reason, uh, now we didn't do all the benchmarks and everything, but the reason was, is these are large complex models. And so just the, you have the slower uh, Rails uh, single process, you know, runtime, and you're instantiating hundreds of objects to just to load up all of this uh, state into memory and they are registering all these callbacks and everything, you know, for uh, the model life, uh, life, the life cycle events. And uh, with Elixir, it's just a much cleaner, uh, simpler approach. And even with the network overhead of talking between the two servers, it was still faster overall. And so I just thought that was a, a testament to, um, I don't know, immutable data and, and how fast uh, Phoenix is able to handle things and its nature of just already being concurrent. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, that's something I observed as well. Um, that's actually one of the things that pushed us to Alex series. The, the, as we kept, I, I'm hesitating to, to say it's a higher performance, but it's maybe like we, we could deal with the workload we were having with smaller amounts of effort, I would say, this way, because the pure performance might not be uh, uh, better of just executing Ruby code versus executing uh, Elixir code. But as soon as garbage collection kicks in, and this case is precisely the case where it constantly kicks in because there are thousands of objects being instantiated uh, whenever you do a query to database in Active Record. And in Elixir, you just Basically, in many cases, in those short living processes in Elixir, garbage collection doesn't even kick in because at the end of the life cycle of the web request, the process is, is just being shut down and uh, there's nothing to clean up because there's no shared state. So uh, garbage collection doesn't affect the performance of Elixir as much as it affects performance of Ruby because then it constantly kick, kicks in. Uh, Yes, uh, I was going to mention one more thing about why Elixir and Phoenix and Ecto seem faster for those types of database-based applications when like, you, you gave up uh, ownership of one table, so I assume there was like a, a SQL database behind it, is 
Ecto itself is quite cool in how it how it uses resources. So in short, it doesn't keep the idle connections on hand to the database. So it, in, in Rails, whenever a web, requ web request comes into the Rails application, a database connection has been checked out from the pool, and then is being kept on hand throughout the uh, uh, request lifecycle. There are some uh, uh, calls being made to the, to, to the uh, database using the single connection, while in Elixir and Ecto, uh, there's a pool of connections and is being checked out every time you want to make a SQL query to the database, and it's being checked in immediately after that query uh, has completed. So if you have five selects uh, uh, in a single web request in Elixir, it might be using five different database connections, and that's fine. It just doesn't keep those on hand idle, so you can do more with the same number of connections in a pool in Elixir than you would have been able to do in Ruby. I've, I've also found it substantially easier to get around, uh, to mentally work around moving computation to the database with Ecto than, than it is with Active Record. It's somewhat trivial to even just make a field be a, be a function. And so you can, in my experience, get lots better performance by literally just doing all the computation in the database. Uh, in a lot of cases, where obviously you could do that in Ruby and Active Record, but I mean, let's be honest, no one does that. And it's much different, much much harder to make uh, easy to make mistakes. Like in Active Record, especially, you can unwillingly, uh, by omission, make SQL make SQL qu queries from your views, from your templates, basically by iterating over some something in that is it looks like an object has some children you are trying to iterate over those children uh, to render some list for example and you're making SQL queries at that very moment while in Elix and Acto you would be forced to actually preload the data because if you try to iterate over something that hasn't been loaded you're gonna get an error so it looks like an inconvenience because you're getting an error while you're developing the application it doesn't work on your, on your first try while you try it, iterating over it because you haven't loaded it, but you are forced to actually explicitly load the data you want. Yeah, if you're using the repo in the view, you know what you did. Yes. So one other thing that uh, I'm, I'm just going to kind of push toward, I, I'm just looking through your article and I'm, I'm really enjoying a lot of the things that you put in here. One of them is channels. Uh, do you want to talk about that briefly? I guess it's a function or a, a feature of Phoenix. And uh, yeah, I see a lot of people, especially in the Node world, using things like I forget the name of the library, but they, they do Socket, Socket.io. Mm -hmm. you know, so they're doing web sockets and things like that. And it looks like Phoenix also handles that pretty nicely, though at kind of a different level, I guess, than you know, so, some of these other systems do. Yes, it's an abstraction uh, that can be built. That I think by default it ships. Please, guys, correct me if I'm wrong here because uh, I might be wrong. It definitely ships with a backend that's uh, based on WebSocket protocol. And the whole API is similar to, to the WebSocket API. However, it can be also using long polling, for example, and possibly other transportation methods. So it's an abstraction uh, also in, in, in JavaScript side of things. Uh, or uh, there are also clients for um, iOS and Android uh, that uh, can use channels. Uh, it's just a, a means to push things in both directions between server and the front end. So you can send messages back to the server in real time and get those messages from server and they will arrive sequentially. So it's like TCP IP. Uh, it doesn't just fire events. They also ensure that they arrive uh, in, in proper order. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool for building real-time apps where you have to synchronize some things. Yeah, and you mentioned its uh, interaction with GraphQL subscriptions, but yeah, I will, I will say GraphQL subscriptions with uh, Phoenix and Absinthe is just so very pleasant. And it's built on, on precisely on, on, on top of Phoenix so and uh, channels, so that's another layer of abstraction. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I know Chris McCord, he's the primary author and maintainer of Phoenix. When he started creating Phoenix, he did it because he wanted a uh, web server that had channels or, or a web socket support as a first class that's like its 
excellent at solving this problem. And so that was one of the things he really made us a, a top priority was to have channels. And channels are implemented really well. Like they are, it's creating a, an Elixir process per uh, socket and to manage the state of the connection. And it's, I think they're, they're beautiful. I love uh, solving interesting problems with them and just being able to you know, push state down to the client to here's some data that's been updated kind of real time. So you're not doing the, the long polling. And yeah, it is an elegant solution. And I think Elixir is really well suited for solving that problem just with the way the processes work and managing the statefulness of it. That's very much correct. But you're still, if you're using raw channels, you're still the one responsible for designing the communication protocol and you're still responsible for giving it a proper structure. And, you know, there's a lot of temptations uh, around that just to cut things short and, and you know, to, to shortcuts, basically. That's uh, yeah. Guilty. That's why, <laughs> that's why I like GraphQL and that's why I like GraphQL subscriptions because it actually forces you to think about the structure and the, what's the protocol to exchange information that we're using. And that's especially true of subscriptions. So we've, we've talked a lot about some of the reasons to use Elixir, use Phoenix, use some of the things in the Elixir ecosystem. Are there, are there things you wish it had or things you wish it would borrow from other ecosystems like Ruby or Node or Java or something else? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I used to respond with, oh, we need some libraries for this, this, and this. We are largely there. So if you're looking for a library to do something, you are quite likely to find it in, in, in Elixir and Erlang ecosystem. There's a lot of happening also in Erlang itself recently, which is a nice feedback loop, I think. That, that's something we didn't touch on. Because, but uh, a lot of things I wish wished uh, that they were in Erlang slash Elixir actually showed up because they've been introduced to Erlang. And that's another interesting thing. And, what's and, and what's an they, example of an Erlang uh, introduction that you were looking for? Right, so Erlang had a traditionally different way of modeling data, uh, talking about records here. It brought up improvements on how it handles structured data in, in, in a way from like maps, for example, uh, from uh, Elixir. There's, Definitely a lot of improvements, but a lot of things that haven't been touched in Erlang that are pretty obscure. Like, okay, we have this thing that allows you to have like a little sessions with, with, with inside Erlang and has been broken like forever. It's been fixed because some people started using it with Elixir. So there's definitely more Erlang users reporting bugs and fixing the bugs, making pull requests because of Elixir. So, so the core platform also improves. Uh, I guess there are also frustrations for, from some hardcore Erlang developers like, oh, we don't need this Elixir. And that's, that's fair. But I think overall, the effect on the Erlang is very much positive uh, because of Elixir and also other languages on the Beam. It's like it's becoming this JVM-like platform where different languages run on top of virtual machine rather than just a platform built for single programming language. And that's really interesting because you get to have things like Clojure running on Erlang, which is something I'm looking into recently. Yeah, I saw, I saw that recently as well. Um, I will say the first uh, Erlang factory that I went to, there was a bit of, I don't, I don't want to say disdain, but there were, there were quite a few people that just had no respect for Elixir. Um, and we're pretty prominent and pretty uh, open about it. And I've not really seen that much anymore. That seems to have gone away. I think there's appreciation that it helped kind of revitalize the Erlang system a little bit. And uh, it definitely brought this uh, wave of fresh air to Erlang ecosystem when there have been projects that haven't been really maintained. And now there are Elixir users using those projects. And they, they have been revived uh, also like Erlang libraries. So it definitely helps simply have more users of your uh, uh, programming environment. And, 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 you, and you can improve because you have the user base. That's interesting. And it makes sense. 
Because yeah, if people are using it and they want to improve it, then they'll improve it. And that means if they have to go to Erlang or, you know, some other means of getting their code compiled, you know, to the beam, then yeah, it makes sense that they would go that direction. So are there any other things that we should dive into here? Um, you know, we've, we've talked about nerves on the show, you know, and some of the other aspects of, uh, I, I think somebody also mentioned on the show that they don't see any reason to, to use like, uh, what is it like job queues and things like that in the same way that you do in Ruby, where you have a separate process that manages that because you can just hand it off. And we talked about the way that we distribute those and do microservices and things like that. Um, but is there anything else to dive into here that we want to talk about before we go to picks? Well, possibly we could discuss briefly when you would like not to use uh, Elixir. When when is yeah? When is it is it a bad fit for for you? And uh, from my experience, I would say that major problem is that like if you cannot hire people to do that, then it mm-hmm. definitely don't go with Elixir, and, or your dev team doesn't want to do that because they're hardcore. Uh, Ruby or PHP or Java developer, object-oriented developers, that, that's a valid reason enough not to go with Elixir, I would say. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you guys have any other ideas? I think the team buy-in is a big one. Um, I'd mentioned before on the show um, how I had a, a friend who is the CTO of a company, and they have a predominantly Ruby shop. And he is coming in at, at the top level and understands the benefits of Elixir and is kind of uh, advocating for it. But, you know, when you don't have that uh, champion who's coming from like the grassroots level and they're pushing for it, then you don't really have buy-in. And I think that does make it a really hard sell. And then you get people who are frustrated because they're not excited about it. That It feels like it's being pushed on them. So I think buy-in is, and the team, the team makeup that you have is a really important aspect. I used to have one more argument when you would not use Elixir is when, when there's a lot of things like libraries you can just grab in and put together your application faster. I don't use that anymore because I think the, the focus, two things happen. One, those libraries, they actually appeared on the Elixir side of things. So the ecosystem is wider. There's more stuff. But also a lot of those libraries, they've been... Uh, allowing you to bootstrap things like user interface, uh, user-facing web pages quicker. And we simply don't do that anymore. That's often in backend technologies like Ruby on Elixir. Instead, we do those things on the client side. And we can discuss whether that's uh, that's correct way of doing things or it's not correct way of doing things. But this is the way of most teams are doing things now. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's a topic for different podcasts altogether. But yeah, the importance of having those libraries that, that you can use to, to build user-facing uh, front-end is just became less important. Just to speak to a couple of other points uh, where Elixir may not be a good fit, is it's, we've talked about how it is not, we, we talk about how it's performant, but a lot of that is because it's concurrent and parallel. Uh, but it's not necessarily a fast number cruncher, right? It's like C or Go are going to be faster at like just pure computation. So, but that's, what's nice about that is you can still have Elixir being able to shunt around the work that needs to be done and then using NIFs or ports or something, have it actually be number crunched on by a, a tool that is more appropriate or and better suited for that. And yeah. I, don't, I don't think you're going to see any 3D games written in uh elixir anytime soon probably not i i bet i bet after this elixir conf when void Multer uh shows off his new ui framework he will but um that'd be cool but uh yeah i was also going to say i had a a situation where i needed sort of raw performance i didn't need it to be crazy good but i needed to be faster than it was and uh using there's a thing called high performance erlang hype so you can compile your application using hype and it'll uh build machine code version of your module so the Erlang module format will ship with both the uh, Beam bytecode as well as an architecture-specific machine bytecode. And then if you deploy it on a different architecture, it'll just use the interpreter, or, right? But uh, it, it can also use the machine code. And so that actually gave me some, I don't, even, I don't remember the numbers, it was some ridiculous, like, you know, 2300 times, or t- sorry, 23x 
performance increase, which was enough that I didn't need to go implement stuff that was very easy to reason about in Elixir in something like Go. So, and just That's a caveat, if, if you use Hype, you have to compile everything to Hype or else you'll lose the performance benefit when it does context switching between the interpreter and the machine code. So uh, there's some, some work you have to do, but you can get really good performance with Hype. Uh, it's just kind of not as explored as maybe I'd like. Yeah, I haven't really explored that it that much. Uh, I tried to compiling one large app, and I think it didn't really work uh, well in that uh, regard because I think there was too much context switching up. Somehow, I, I couldn't compile it all using Hype. There yeah, the been... docu- the documentation around that is is really bad. It took me like three days to figure out how to do it, and then I you know I was getting like one point two x speed ups. And I knew it should have been much better. And eventually, I figured out how to get the standard library compiled with Hype, and then everything ah. got much better. Ah, that might be that might be it actually, because I don't think I was compiling the standard library with Hype. Uh, you mentioned NIFs. Uh, I think uh, Mark, you mentioned NIFs uh, yeah. as a way to improve things. Uh, just a word of caution: you have to be super careful, and uh, probably you might not want to use those, because it's really easy to crash the whole Erlang Beam virtual machine if you do that. I found it uh, in one of the client's projects, simpler to, to use the Elixir strengths and just uh, supervise uh, separate uh, system level processes and communicate with those from Erlang virtual machine rather than mm-hmm. rely on NIFs. So that's another approach you can, you can use and build an app in, in Go or whatever is performant enough. To, to, to do those sort of number crunching you need or see and just communicate with message passing and supervise it from airline. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. And you're talking about some of these performance enhancements. And generally, my experience has been that the company will save more money by um, improving the performance of their developers through things like automation and better processes and things like that, yep. um, better tooling, that kind of thing, as opposed to improving the performance on the server when you know the user experience is fine so yeah i'd say most of the time you don't need that level of optimization yeah. it's only certain types of workloads perhaps that mm-hmm. would need that yeah i was going to say i mean if you have you know thousands of servers then you might be talking about oh this performance will allow us to eliminate 10% of those and then you're starting to talk about real money but yeah it, it is interesting though to kind of do the mental gymnastics of going okay what else can we squeeze out of this thing, right? Because you kind of get this scorecard every time you run the benchmarks or measure the the, the load that you're getting and, and how much load you're putting on your servers. You know, it's like, oh, okay, we're we're at 80% full, you know, and we put this in and now now our score is 60% full, right? We saved ourselves all this this compute and it's it's a it's a number, it's a score that we can keep score on. So it's it's kind of fun to attack that way. Uh, another thought I have on, on that scaling and, and performance. Uh, thing I have in mind, uh, which I forgot to bring up earlier, is in one of the projects we were contemplating how we scale the Rails app. And uh, we were thinking about adding more servers, obviously. In that stage, that would be like five or six servers. Maybe we get to the point where we have 10 of those and things start to get complicated uh, on, on the DevOps side of things. However, we then decided to go with Elixir, and uh, after half a year or so, uh, we ended up. Well, we chose Elixir for that project uh, precisely because we thought that okay, we're gonna need that five or six or ten or maybe more servers. You know, we we so so we chose Elixir and uh, we thought that maybe we're gonna do clustering in the future. We ended up using one because the overall performance. Uh, allowed us to stick to one and just scale it a bit vertically rather than scale it horizontally, which, which, you know, it, certain types of apps, this is not a bad thing. If you can do with one simple machine, simple deployment, that really saves you some trouble, uh, you know, deploying to more complicated uh, setups. So, so I can definitely see a value here as well. Sounds good. Well, I need to start wrapping up. So I'm going to um, really quickly ask people or ask where people can find you online. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, com slash Hubert Lipitsky. Amberbit.com on the bottom, uh, there's a contact link to, 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 to send me an email as well. Uh, GitHub, everywhere is the same. My first name, last name. Awesome. 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood, and I've been asked more times than I can count, how do I stay current? There's a lot to this question, and I'm working on a solution. Code badges. That's right. You heard me right. Basically, the idea is, is that you come and do a code badge, and that gets you an introduction to a topic. Then you can decide if you want to pursue it further. But while working on the badge, you gain enough proficiency to be able to pick it up again if you need. A lot of technology comes through on the bleeding edge, and not all of it sticks, but the principles do. So doing badges on the technologies that will get you ahead will provide you with experience needed to stay competitive. Plus, it offers social proof that you know something about the topic. The project is on Kickstarter right now. You can support it and get on the launch list at codebadge.org. Josh, do you want to start us off with picks? Absolutely. So I don't think that I've brought this one up before, but I'm really excited about it. Uh, if I have, I'm sorry, but there's a library for Elm called GraphQLM. Um, there's actually two of them. There's, this one is from Dylan Kearns. And what it does is it will talk to your GraphQL endpoint, do introspection, and produce uh, type-safe modules representing it so that you can make, make requests. And what's really, really nice about it is um, I was using it for, for something, actually for the comments section on smoothterminal.com. And uh, sort of some complexities around interacting with the back end made me realize that, hey, I have my types in GraphQL uh, a little too loose. And tightening them up helped both on... Uh, the, the other app that uses the endpoint as well as made the ARM kind of nicer. So just by using it, I made my code better. And that's always something that makes me happy. So GraphQL, I'll put a link. Awesome. Mark, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, nothing specific. I've been, I'm just picking the idea of ongoing learning and continuing your personal development. Currently, I'm reading a book. Um, it's a technical book on a DevOps with Kubernetes. And so it's nothing Elixir specific. And I wouldn't necessarily... I don't know if I would necessarily recommend this specific book over any other book, but uh, just the idea of continuing to learn and grow your skill set. And right now, I'm having fun with learning Kubernetes, and I'll be deploying my Elixir apps with that shortly. Awesome. I'm going to throw in a couple of picks. One pick that I have is... So there's a book series that I've really enjoyed uh, listening to on Audible. Uh, it's the Iron Druid Chronicles. Anyway, really, really, really enjoyed the series, but the last book was kind of disappointing to me. So I'm, I'm kind of lukewarm picking the last book, but the rest of the series is terrific. So if you're looking for kind of a fun urban fantasy, uh, definitely check it out. Um, I'll put a link to, uh, to it on Amazon, but you can also get it on Audible. One other pick that I have is uh, on my iPad. My two-year-old was in here during most of this recording because uh, my wife had to run over to the school and volunteer for something. And it has a mode, I can't remember what it's called, but you can essentially lock out the screen and the controls. Um, and so... Uh, I, I just really like that. You just hit the home button three times and it'll, it'll let you lock it out and set a pin to unlock it or use your fingerprint to unlock it. So um, if you're looking for a good way to kind of hand your phone off to your kid without uh, allowing them to close the app or anything like that, you can, uh, you can do that. It's, it's guided access mode is what it's called. So anyway, handy little tip there for you. Hubert, what are your picks? Uh, yeah, maybe nothing technical. Uh, I would recommend you guys having a look at the Succession. I think this is a series on HBO. I've been really enjoying it recently. Uh, it's really about really messed up rich family, and I highly recommend. It's a good entertainment. Uh, so that would be my pick. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming. And if any of you are out there and you need some Elixir work done, definitely check out Amberbit, amberbit.com. We'll go ahead and wrap this up and we will catch you all next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more. <laughs>